so many Reaganites, people who served with Reagan who, um, or who have um, contributed um, to the Reagan revolution and legacy um, who did not actually serve. So this is a great night for us, and I welcome you all to the Hoover office. How many of you have been here before? So this is um, a great testament to what Mike Frank, our new director, is doing to bring new people to Hoover in D.C. We are still in Palo Alto. Um, I don't think we'll ever leave, but um, <laughs> this is our, um, our attempt to um, be, be in Washington, and I think it's, um, it's, it's great that we can have these kinds of events. Um, I want to just quickly introduce our speakers and then um, um, really allow them to have a conversation. I can um, start with a question or two, but I would like to open it up to um, both Craig first to maybe give a story or two about the theme of the book and then have um, the Honorable Ed Meese um, um, chime in about some of his experiences with Reagan after he left the White House. This is the first book on Reagan um, um, during his post-presidential years. Most people think that he did nothing. And what's so revelatory about Craig's book is that it paints um, a very different picture. But let me tell you a little bit about Craig Shirley. He's written a couple of critically acclaimed books on Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny, um, and The Untold Story of the Campaign that Changed, that Started It All. He did a book December 1941, most of my students don't know about December 1941 because they were born close to 9-11, so um, this is ancient <laughs> history for them. Um, and um, it appeared multiple times on the New York Times bestseller list and was a finalist for in the history cat, um, category for forward um, reviews um, and the American Library Association's Book of the Year awards. Um, he is a founder along with his, his um, co-author or partner um, and Shirley and Bannister, Diana, I believe, is here. And it was chosen, um, he was also chosen in two, um, 2005 as the outstanding alum of Springfield College. He's the first Reagan scholar at Eureka College where Reagan attended. Um, and his books on Reagan, Reagan's campaigns, have been considered the definitive works on Reagan in 1976 <coughs> and 1980. Um, he's spoken all over the country at universities and colleges, and I've told him um, that he missed his true calling, which was to be an academic. So um, I think he's making up for it um, at this stage of his life. I don't pay enough. Um, that's, tr that's true. How do you figure that one out? Um, and he's regularly sp um, speaking on um, Newsmax, MSNBC, and others. Let me turn now to Ed Meese. Um, I, I'll start by saying that he is a, I think this is okay a distinguished um, fellow at Hoover. And that's his most important title, um, <laughs> as he's told me. Um, and he is, but he was attorney general once. I think, I don't know if my flower is in the way, um, if I'm doing something wrong. Okay, am I better? Okay, um, he, was, he was attorney general during the Reagan administration, very different than the current um, um, attorney general under President Obama, um, but he served as Attorney General from 1985 to 88. Um, and he holds a distinguished Reagan chair at the Heritage Foundation. Not exactly our rival, our friend. <laughs> um, and he's a, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress. And he has won the Distinguished Bradley Prize in 2012. Um, he was with Reagan throughout um, his gubernatorial years, um, presidential campaign in 1980. He played a pivotal role um, and during the transition as well. I could go on and on, but you're not here to hear more from me about their bios, but to turn to this um, important discussion about last act. So help me in welcoming um, our panelists. So I could just say one word that I think, um, when I read your book, that um, really made me reflect on, um, on dates. And um, centuries and, um, and, and decades often don't end on their numerical, physical time. And that's what I thought about when reading your book, that Reagan didn't really end when he left the presidency, even though he said, I'm done. Um, which my students say all the time, but actually Reagan said it first, <laughs> I'm done, <laughs> January 20th, 1989. But your book is about the fact that Reagan actually wasn't done. No. And it's also about the fact that when Reagan died, 
um, in June of 2004, and there was a spontane spontaneous National Week of Mourning, which wasn't planned, but actually it became that, that he wasn't done then, that in fact it was a period of, I think, of, of really many being reconciled to the fact that Reagan was a causal actor for most of the 20th century yes. and beyond. So that's what I thought about your book. So I'll stop and let you respond. Well, I, I guess it, to, to start with Chiron is um, the, um, the idea for the book actually came from uh, our uh, youngest uh, child, Mitchell, who's at Young Harris College now down in Georgia. He's come, coming in tomorrow for uh, Christmas. We, uh, all of our uh, books have been family. If all my books have been family affairs. Zareen, my who, wife is here tonight, has done all the, the editing and Matthew and Andrew and uh, Taylor have done highlighting and fact checking and, and, and all sorts, you know, all editing and things like that. And Mitchell was uh, in the kitchen one night and I was standing at the counter, you know, smoking a cigarette and reading, editing, and, <laughs> and he, he's highlighting these binders, uh, uh, you know, I, I binders from the Reagan Library and from Eureka and news articles and just hundreds and hundreds of binders. They weren't of women either, uh, is that uh, these binders of research information. And he, he used to highlight every time he saw the name Reagan. So he's highlighting through and he just looks up one night and he says to, says to says, Dad, he's 11 years old, he says, Dad, has anybody ever done a book about Reagan after he was president? I thought for a second. And said no, so that was really the birth of of, of last act. And in the course of getting into this, I discovered that there was a lot of terrific scholarship associated with post presidential lives. So you know, when the cheering stopped about Woodrow Wilson's last years and FDR's last year by Jim Bishop, and of course Manhunt about uh, about uh, Lincoln and uh, and. Uh, and uh, Twilight at Monticello by Alan Powell Crawford about uh, Jefferson's post-presidency at, uh, at Monticello. So as I got into it, I discovered there's really a lot of terrific scholarship. And it seemed to me, first of all, it was very important because the shorthand, you know, you, you said Reagan uh, ended there. But it's interesting because his last passage in his diary, the day before he leaves the White House, the day before, he says, first of all, he says, tomorrow I stop being president. That's it. Tomorrow I stop being president. But the other thing he writes is, is that tomorrow back to California and then start of a new life. He's 77 years old <laughs> and he's talking about a new life. I mean, it's remarkably optimistic for a 77 year old man to say that, you know, after eight years of being president, after eight years of being governor, after the lecture circuit, after the Screen Actors Guild, after, is, he's still looking toward the, uh, toward the future. Um, but I wanted to write it because it hadn't been written before, and I didn't want, uh, frankly, I didn't want Kitty Kelly or Bill O'Reilly to write it. And, uh, and <laughs> but, I, but I mean that quite seriously. It is, is that is that we spend the three of us spend uh, Steve Hayward, Paul Kangor, other Reagan histori historians and scholars spend several hours a, a week cleaning up the messes that other people create about disinformation about Ronald Reagan. I got an email today. Uh, another uh, factual error in, uh, in O'Reilly's book is, is that he, he said that Reagan uh, tried to join the Communist Party in the uh, 30s in Hollywood. Well, I never heard that before. You never heard that before. And I, so uh, Borko Komanovic has been with me for many years, my research assistant. I put him on the case and I said, find out where this came from because I don't believe this. Well, it came from Edmund Morris. Edmund Morris just made it up and put it in his book, Dutch. So, it, but O'Reilly puts it in his book as an article of, of fact that Reagan tried to join the Communist Party, which is, which is not true. Uh, so anyway, I, I did it because, I, for a lot of reasons. A, because I don't want Kitty Kelly or, or Bill O'Reilly to write it. B, was that it was important historical uh, information that hadn't been written before. And C is, is that there's the shorthand misinterpretation of Reagan was is that he went back to California, announced he had Alzheimer's and died. But as a matter of fact, he lived for 16 years. And there was a lot of living that went on in those 16 years. He just didn't go back, you know, and uh, kick up his heels. He gave important policy speeches. He gave important political speeches. He built a presidential library. He met with Gorbachev three more times. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. He joined an important society. Uh, in, uh, in France. So there was a lot of living that went on uh, when he left the White House. He was never just going to go back and sit in a rocking chair, even though he used to joke about it. So that's shorthand why I wrote the book.
Well, um, let me turn to um, Mr. Meese. Do you want to share with us some um, stories of Reagan during the post-presidential years? I mean, it's so o he was so overshadowed, I think, historically by having um, Alzheimer's. And so many people think that that's all that happened during those years, that he was in bed for a decade. Um, and can you tell us some of what you experienced? Sure. Well, one of the things was, as, as uh, uh, Craig has said, uh, he had a very active life uh, for several years after leaving the presidency. Uh, he left in January of 1989. Uh, over the next two or three years, he traveled all over the world, uh, as you suggest. He gave a lot of speeches, and quite frankly, uh, he really uh, made, uh, did a lot of uh, work, and speeches were part of it, uh, to make some money, because uh, he was not a rich man as such. Uh, he didn't have a fortune when he went into the presidency, and he had less when he went out. And uh, so uh, he had to, had to really uh, do some things that, that brought in some income, and that was uh, what he did in terms of uh, giving speeches. Uh, and, uh, but also, uh, one of the things, as uh, you suggested, was the work that he did in 1989 through 1991 in developing the Reagan Library. And uh, I was on the library board, one of the founding trustees, uh, with Martin Anderson, mm -hmm. who was uh, one of Chiron's uh, co-authors. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really took an active part in planning uh, the library and attending the monthly meetings we had of, of the library board and uh, was, uh, was very active in that. Uh, the other things he did was he gave a lot of speeches, free speeches, for uh, political purposes. He talked to the, for the, uh, uh, the Young America's Foundation was one. Uh, the uh, 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 CPAC, the Conservative Political Action uh, Conference each year. <coughs> he uh, spoke to, to uh, a number of, uh, of different uh, political organizations, but other things. Uh, he uh, uh, spoke uh, in, uh, in terms of, of carrying on the philosophy and also supporting uh, uh, George Bush, who was, was then the President of the United States, in some of the things he was doing, uh, including the uh, the uh, uh, Gulf War in, in 1991, so that it was really a, a very active thing. He was came to the office every day in uh, Century City there, except on those days that he was able to steal away and go to the ranch, where he also continued to work very hard. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think was interesting, uh, and a conversation I had with him, was he had just come back from a trip to Mexico. I think this was in 1991, if I remember correctly. And uh, I asked him, because I had heard about him uh, having an injury, uh, from uh, uh, from a, a horseback riding down there, and he was very adamant. He wanted me to be, know that he was did not fall off the horse, that the horse threw him, and uh, that, that was a, that to him that was very important as a cowboy that uh, that uh, we understood that. No, but he talked about that, uh, and uh, it was it was uh, so that he really did. And it wasn't until 1993 was the first time that there was even an inkling. Uh, that he had uh, had any problem with, with his memory. And that happened to be uh, on his birthday. We were having a celebration of his birthday, and uh, Margaret Thatcher was there, his 82nd birthday, if I remember correctly. Where was this? Uh, this was, I think, it was in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you did a lot of research on sure. that. Or was it here? Yeah. It wasn't uh, here. Uh, but I remember uh, being there, and uh, he had on his speech cards, uh, he read the same uh, his speech twice from the same card, and that was the first time there had been any inkling that there was any problem. And that was long after he had left the presidency, uh, and uh, and so it was kind of interesting. But he was still very active in all of his activities, which continued really. He continued going to the office regularly right up until 1997, and I was privileged to be one of the few people who saw him uh, in September of 1997, which was about the end of the time that he uh, was able to go to the office and then went into total seclusion during that time. It was interesting for me because it meant that I had uh, worked with him uh, in one way or another for over 30 years, from 1966 when I first met him after he'd been elected governor until uh, September of 1997, which was the last time. But uh, it was very active and uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting uh, to note uh, the other things that he had gotten started uh, in that library, because the library ultimately became, I think, uh, the finest of the presidential libraries, not only in the having the uh, Air Force One there and the other exhibits and so on, but the uh, 
chronological history that it represents. Mm -hmm. The other thing was uh, he had developed the ranch, doing a lot of the work himself, particularly uh, prior to uh, 1995, which I think was the, the last time he was at the ranch. But uh, he had done a lot of the building of the, uh, of the fences there, a lot of the uh, clearing of brush. Uh, it was the kind of things that he really enjoyed doing, mm -hmm. and uh, as well as horseback riding, of course, yeah. which when he was at the ranch, he did virtually every day that he was there. Mm -hmm. So it was a very active post-presidency time, mm -hmm. which was very beneficial to the country uh, to have the kinds of things that he did, particularly the talks that he gave at that time, where he could speak as literally as an elder statesman. Uh, and so show how the things that had got gotten started during his presidency were now carrying on, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was economically, whether it was in world affairs, and of course to have been able to live to see the fruits of his work, particularly in national security, uh, come to, to fruition mm -hmm. uh, with the end of the Cold War, uh, with freedom winning, uh, and with the ultimate implosion of the Soviet Union. Can you tell us a, a story or two that you think really stands out in your book um, that suggests that What's Reagan wrong with it? that Reagan <laughs> was still a policy actor um, during the post um, presidency years? The, 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 well, he also wrote an autobiography, and if you read the autobiography, which is very important also because uh, I think he had channeled Winston Churchill, who you know once said, you know, history is going to be kind to of me for I intend to write it. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, and he and if you read his autobiography, it's very much Ronald Reagan. It's not a third person writing it and Reagan taking a hands off. He was very very involved in his own. He wanted to have a say in his own uh, in, uh, legacy in, uh, in American life. And interestingly enough, if you read his first autobiography, which wears the rest of me, and then his the second one is is that. Uh, in American life, they track very close together, so it's obvious that he was very involved with the uh, with the book. Two of my favorite stories uh, from the um, from my book from Last Act were uh, is that I was interviewing uh, Fred Ryan, who was Reagan's first post presidential chief of staff. I interviewed him, and he was very helpful and cooperative. But he told me about how uh, a couple months, at, no, a couple weeks, take that back, a couple weeks after. Reagan goes back to California. This is now February, March of 89. And he and uh, Nancy, Mrs. Reagan, were supposed to relax and, uh, and, and kind of keep a low profile for several months. And so they were at the Century City office, mm -hmm. which is another story, because Fred went to look for office space for, uh, 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 for, for the post-presidency. And he picked a spot where they just finished mo filming the movie Die Hard. Uh, and the Secret Service said to him, it says, you just picked a building that was depicted as being blown up in a movie. And, and uh, so they were a little bit concerned about that. But anyway, but Reagan moved in anyway. Uh, is that, but, but so anyway, Reagan had gone back, and he was supposed to, he and Nancy were supposed to, Mrs. Reagan was supposed to take a couple months off, and, and Reagan got bored hanging around the house, so he called the library, or he called the, uh, the office, said, I'm coming in. And they're unpacking boxes, they're in dungarees, they scramble to put together a makeshift office for Reagan. And Reagan comes in, they greet him, he goes into his office, shuts the door. They go back to work. A couple hours later, Reagan comes out with a piece of paper and he gives it to Fred. He says, I'd like to meet with these people. And Fred looks at it and doesn't recognize one single solitary name. And he says, excuse me, Mr. President, who are these people? And Reagan says, well, they've been calling. Uh, the, the, in their haste to, 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 to uh, get the office assembled, they miswired the receptionist phone, so the receptionist phone went to Reagan's office, <laughs> and so the receptionist was sitting there for hours twiddling her thumbs, and the phones are going directly to Reagan's office, and he said, hi, this is Ronald Reagan. Well, this is Joe Blow. I want to talk to you. Uh, okay. And so he wrote every, everyone down, and, and true to form, they all got in to get a picture taken with Reagan, although one guy said to, uh, Fred called him back to, to confirm it and the date and this and this, and the guy says, well, this is, this is great. I want to bring my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> and Fred says, listen, buddy, you got lucky once here. The lightning's not going to strike again. So, <laughs> the, the other one, uh, which I think speaks volumes about Reagan's capacity for Christian forgiveness, was that several months, uh, pronounced Rugi, right? It was Danny Rugi, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, right. Is several months after 
uh, the uh, shooting, he called Dr. Daniel Ruge, who was the White House physician, into his office. And he had been, he'd been thinking for a time about reaching out to John Hinckley. John Hinckley was at the time institutionalized at St. Elizabeth's. And um, uh, he wanted to meet with him to tell him that he forgave him. Not an official presidential pardon, but a personal, a personal private. And so Ruge says, well, Mr. President, that's an interesting idea. I'll look into it. So he called Dr. Roger Peel, who is the head of uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And Dr. Peel was intrigued by the idea because he knew uh, St. Elizabeth's was about to be transferred from, uh, from the federal government to the state government, or to the city, DC, yeah. to city district uh, authority. And it needed a lot of funding, and a presidential visit might just rain down a lot of federal uh, funds on top of uh, the, uh, the perpetually strapped uh, institution. But so he said, look, I'll, uh, this intriguing idea, I'll talk to Hinckley's psychiatrist. Hinckley had six psychiatrists. And he went and talked to them. And to a person, they said, absolutely not. Uh, and it wasn't political at all. They said, this young man is the most narcissistic, sociopathic patient we've ever had. He has no understanding of anybody else's pain except his own. And for Reagan to visit him, would communicate the wrong message. It would be that it was vindication for what he had done. Uh, so Reagan ended up not visiting with Hinckley, uh, but it was on the recommendation of Hinckley's doctors. Uh, but uh, Dr. Peel, who I interviewed extensively, said, uh, told me that the Reagan White House was utterly, completely polite. They invited him to uh, the uh, White House mess later for uh, lunch and uh, gave him several photos and things like that. And one time, at one point during this whole process, Dr. Peel was talking uh, to Reagan. And he later thought, he said, he said, it sounded like I was talking to Reagan as if he was in the clouds or something like that. And he later found out that Reagan had been calling him from Air Force One. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so but I think those are, those are two good stories. Uh, is uh, Reagan's sense of humor, which was boundless, and also his Christian charity, which was also boundless. Um, Ed, you said that the, la the last time that you visited with Reagan was before he went into seclusion. Right. You never had a interaction with him, even by phone, w once he went in? No, nobody did. Uh, Nancy was very protective, uh, and she felt that people ought to remember Ronald Reagan when he was vigorous and active and that sort of thing. And uh, while his memory was, was obviously fading when I saw him, but he was still able to go to the office and to carry on conversations. He didn't initiate much, but he did respond, and, and uh, she wanted uh, that to be the way people remembered him, not as uh, uh, you know, a, a person who was not fully capable of, of acting and, and, and being, uh, being Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things that he did, of course, was keep in touch with Gorbachev uh, after he had left the presidency. And uh, one of the things that really affected me personally was uh, the night of the, uh, after the funeral in Washington, D.C., and uh, he was flown uh, back to California. And so Larry King had a program in which he uh, had all kinds of people calling in and, and expressing their views and so on. And uh, they had asked uh, two people uh, to be the people that were kind of the, the narrators, if you will, or co-moderators uh, of the program. <laughs> And the two people uh, to show the dichotomy of Ronald Reagan's affiliations was on the one hand it was me, and on the other hand it was Gorbachev. <laughs> and, and I thought that was really significant. That Gorbachev, who had been his international head of the forces that he had conquered, if you will, or led the, the free world in conquering, uh, here was Gorbachev being one of the people who was a commentator on his funeral. Um. I want to open up um, the discussion because um, we're here to hear from you as well. So um, I'd like to begin taking questions. I have a number of them, but I think I can talk with, with Craig anytime offline. We occasionally pair up with uh, two others um, to um, defend Reagan or to just get the record straight, not for Do our um, best. Um, in, in the Washington Post. But I'd like to hear from some others. We have a roving mic, um, and I'd like to make that available to to anyone. I'll start with um, you in the back. Yes. 
Uh, I would say that uh, particularly after it was after his his illness was revealed, that that was the best time that he had had with his children in quite some period of time. They literally came back to the house. Uh, they were uh, regularly uh, visited him and were particularly in the last uh, few weeks and so on were very helpful to Nancy uh, and uh, uh, and all of his children. Well, of course, uh, by that time, uh, one of his children had pa pass passed away, predeceased him. Right. Uh, but Mike, uh, Mike was very faithful in coming and uh, Mike often described how uh, he would see the president and the president would know him and as soon as the president saw him his eyes would kind of light up uh, and he described how uh, when he left he always gave the president a hug and he said one day he was busy and so he left and uh, was rushing out to the car and he looked back and there was the president kind of looking a little bit forlorn with his hands like this he had forgotten to give him a hug in passing and so he turned back of course and and greeted the president but uh, I think both the president and Nancy were very appreciative of the way in which the children and the family came back together during those uh, last difficult days. Mm -hmm. um, just to give some historical context, it was November 1994 that Reagan penned a letter to the nation announcing right. that he had Alzheimer's. Um, can you both tell us why you think he would do that? Um, that was a bold move. We hadn't seen that kind of revelation. We're in revel we're now in reality politics, but people didn't tell those kinds of things at that point. No, in fact, and presidential uh, health was very much was, was covered up. Okay. Nobody knew about John Kennedy's uh, right. afflictions, and uh, right. uh, of course, Franklin Roosevelt. You know, only uh, the 14, 13 right. years in the White House, only two photographs were taken of him right. uh, in a in wheelchair, wheelchair and, yeah. and it was never. Not, I mean, most people didn't know, right. but they also didn't know that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson suffered from melancholia or, or Abraham Lincoln's afflictions is that presidential health was right. was covered up. Woodrow so Wilson probably Wood being one did, of the Woodrow primary Wilson's stroke, stories, right. yeah. but in, which is why Edith Wilson uh, basically ran the country for 18 months. So in uh, November 1994, Reagan writes the nation um, announcing his Alzheimer's. This is after um, the birthday that you had mentioned in 1993, yeah. and then it's 1997. It, he goes um, basically into seclusion. So um, my question is, why do you think that he wrote this letter to the nation? I think it was because he always wanted to be honest with, pe with the people of the country. And when he was president, uh, that was the way he was. Uh, he, I don't think there's any time that, that uh, he tried to dissemble, uh, even if it would have been politically advantageous. Mm -hmm. He was very, always very honest about everything mm -hmm. uh, that went on. And uh, it was just his nature. But also, I think he wanted people to understand why he was not doing the kinds of things like giving speeches and that sort of thing mm -hmm. that he had done previously so that they would understand. Uh, just like uh, with the horse incident that I mentioned, he wanted to have the truth come out about that. He wanted the same thing to come out about uh, his illness. Mm -hmm. And also, I think he also had in mind, because he had known people who had uh, some sort of dementia because of age, I think he felt that that would help uh, for p the public generally to understand about Alzheimer's. And I think that that, that was the, the combined motivation. Of course, this, this, I don't think Neil was ever actually diagnosed, but no, they believe Neil died of, and, and also his mother. True. His mother uh, had now, it also, uh, also yeah. died of Alzheimer's. But uh, Ed is absolutely right, obviously, um, is that uh, he uh, got the news that day, that Saturday, and Fred Ryan told me he thought it was, it was kind of poignant because on the TV playing football was Notre Dame where he played George Gipp and mm -hmm. USC, which he said was the only college in California he went to where people didn't throw things at him. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but he, what was interesting was that Mrs. Reagan already knew. She'd already had her emotional bout. She called Fred Ryan and says, you have to come over. They're going to tell the president tomorrow, this Saturday. And so Fred came over, and the doctors tell Reagan, now you tell somebody they have Alzheimer's, it's a death sentence. It's a death sentence. He says, you are, I mean, we all know we're going to die, we just, we, but we get up every morning not knowing when we're going to die. But now you have Alzheimer's, and it's basically saying you have a certain amount of time left. And it was, he goes, he, he digests it, he understands it, and he goes, they're in the den there at, uh, at, uh, uh, at the house there at Bel Air, and he goes to a table and he pulls out a paper and he sits down and he starts mm -hmm. to write the letter. Mm 
And Fred says, Mr. President, what are you doing? And Reagan says, oh, I guess we better tell the American people. His, his first thought, he doesn't fall to his knees and say, oh, God, why me? He doesn't cry out. He doesn't, his first thought is about informing the American people and telling them about, in the letter, how you know, they, they'd been public about other things, about his cancers and Mrs. Reagan's breast cancer and her surgery and how maybe it helped people. But his thir first thought was about other people and the American people, which I just, again, I think is just remarkable. Um, we have a number of questions. I would like to just mention that Speaker Newt Gingrich has just joined us, and I'd like to thank you for, for coming. I know in your office you have a, a picture of a very much younger Newt with Nancy <laughs> and, um, and Ron Reagan um, during the years when you were um, fighting so hard in Congress, so thank you for being here. Um, yes, you straight in the back. I believe I've heard this story before, General Meese, but could you tell us the story of when you first met uh, Governor Reagan and, and first first joined his administration in Sacramento. Yes, it was uh, in uh, 1966. Uh, I had never met him before. I was not part of the campaign or anything. Uh, I had done some uh, legislative work in the early 60s, in 1961, representing the district attorneys and chiefs of police and sheriffs of California because I was in the district attorney's office and my boss was the chairman of the law and legislative committee of those three groups. And so I'd done some work in the legislature representing him and those, those organizations. So somebody apparently, I later learned, had recommended me to Ronald Reagan. But out of the blue, one day, I was in my office and got this call, would I come up and meet the new governor, or the governor-elect at that time? So I drove to Sacramento wondering what this was all about. And uh, uh, I had a, uh, they arranged for me, uh, I, not on that day, but to come back. Uh, they said they wanted to talk to me about a possible job. Well, I, I was not interested in I liked the job I had and was not interested in moving. So when I, the next time I came up, the president, uh, the governor then uh, came in and we had a half hour together and I was just amazed at how much he knew about criminal law, uh, something that I knew quite a bit about having served uh, for eight years at that time in the profession doing this every day, but also how much our ideas jibed on what ought to be done from the standpoint of the governor, things like pardons, things like uh, dealing with the people who are on condemned row awaiting execution, things like that, how to handle these things. Uh, and uh, at the end, he surprised me by offering me the job as his legal affairs secretary. Uh, I was so impressed with him on this first meeting that I accepted on the spot, surprising myself, I think, and uh, then drove home trying to figure out how I was going to explain to my wife that we were going to be moving. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I thought I'd go up for a couple of years and then at the end of two years, uh, Bill Clark, who was his uh, chief of staff, became a judge, and he offered me the judgeship. And so I gave up any thought of going back to the district attorney's office and was with him the whole time. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. Um, part of the book there in the subtitle talks about his uh, Part of the book talks about Ronald Reagan's emerging legacy. What do you think today is the most important piece of that legacy? Because it seems to me the world is still a very scary place right now. Russia is back on the rise. Americans are feeling very uncertain about the future. And it seems a little bit like the Republican Party has lost a lot of that cheerful optimism that so defined Reagan and what he was able to accomplish. What remains of his legacy and, and what should Republicans and Americans now think about drawing on from him? <laughs> um, that's a lot. Um, I, I, Ed may disagree, but I think that there is a, there is a distinct strain of American conservatism that is Reaganism, uh, as there are other strains of American conservatism. It is based on the individual. It's based on the privacy of the individual. He talk, very often, many times, he talked about individual rights. As a matter of fact, in 1981, uh, when he was talking to a group of conservatives here about pitching his tax cuts, he, was, he said, well, it's about the economy and this and that, but it's really about reordering man's relationship to the state. Now, A, that's a very profound thought. B, who talks like that anymore? <laughs> is, but he understood that power can neither be destroyed nor created. It can only be moved around. So power is either going to be the state or it's going to be the individual. He wanted to move it from the time of the New Deal forward. Power had been draining away from the individual and the, the cities and localities and coming to Washington. He wanted to reverse that and send it back to the states where the framers and the founders intended it to be. And, I think he was actually successful. 
So, but, but it was also based also on uh, optimistic belief in the future. And again, again, I think that's Reag singularly Reaganism itself as opposed to just conservatism, which is something different. Um, it, I, I don't know what he would think today. Ed would know better than I would. Uh, is that it, certainly everybody invokes Ronald Reagan. Uh, you know, this is, doesn't mean that they are Ronald Reagan. Uh, that you know, John Patrick Diggins, who was a very good historian, who was also liberal. He was in many ways the official historian for the American left in the 20th century. He wrote books about. American labor movement and the civil rights movement and the environmental movement, but his last book, and actually he was at Berkeley and kind of did a little bit of battle with Governor Reagan during the whole free speech movement days. But his last book is called Ronald Reagan, Fate, Freedom, and the Making of History. And in this book, this liberal professor says that Ronald Reagan is one of our four greatest presidents because like Washington, Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt, he saved or freed many, many people. And I think that's probably the best definition of, of, of a successful or great American president is, is that did they save or free many, many people. I think also uh, 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 James McGregor Burns, who was again another liberal historian who was mm -hmm. of FDR, he said he would put Reagan in the great or near great category. I think that's all, we've, the, the academic discussion about Reagan is probably over. He was a great president. The facts are clear. The Soviet Union was losing the Cold War in 1980, 1989. It was winning the Cold War. By 1989, it's losing the Cold War. The economy was in shambles in 1980 and 1989. Unemployment is at a 5.2 percent, which economists said is impossible. Inflation is eradicated. Interest rates are eradicated. He leaves office with the approval rating of 73 percent of the American people. Approval rating of voters under 30 is higher than that. Some polls have it 76. 78 percent among voters under 30. Among African-American voters, his approval rating is 40 percent. Now, I, <laughs> so I think in, in, in every measurement is, is that the academic discussion about Reagan is over. It's just whether or not people continue to understand what Reaganism means in American politics today. I don't think, frankly, that most of the candidates running for 2016 understand what Reaganism means other than just simply in a superficial sort of way, uh, is that Reaganism is much more of an intellectual discipline than I think that most people understand. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, I think uh, what I would, I, I think just the fact that he what he accomplished itself is both an inspiration and an example to other people of what can be done. When Ronald Reagan took office in 1981, I don't think even he, with his tremendous optimism, re thought that w the Cold War would be over as rapidly as it was, nor did he realize that the, incre the gain in the economy, the growth of the economy, could be accomplished to the extent that it was. 25 years of continued economic growth uh, with a few hiccups along the way, but a basically a sound economy that lasted a quarter of a century. Uh, those were things that he accomplished. And the other thing is, I think it, he has also given us a laboratory test of two theories. One is the free market theory of economics, and the other is the left-wing theory of economics. And today we have an absolute laboratory case, because if you take the situation and compare Ronald Reagan in the 1980s and Obama in the 2000s, uh, you had Ron both of them inherited recessions, uh, great recessions. Uh, both of them had about the same period of time they, that they took office. And then you see what happened. In the case of Ronald Reagan, by the time 1984 came around, it was morning in America. We had the, as uh, Craig pointed out, the unemployment was down, the economy was on its way up. Uh, we, likewise, we had rebuilt our military forces. There were all kinds of things that represented something that he did and accomplished. Not, by contrast, we see today that we still have an economy today, uh, seven years later, uh, where we, our economic growth, instead of being four, five, six, or seven percent as it was in the 80s, uh, we have an economic, uh, we're barely able to, to make two percent, uh, if that. Uh, we have unemployment, the real unemployment, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine to ten percent, uh, and it looks like 5.4, maybe it's 5.0 now, only because people have dropped out of the economy. We have a lower percentage of people 
uh, as a percentage of the population actually working, and many of the people that are working are part-time. You contrast that with the fact that every segment of the economy gained and was better off in 1989 when Ronald Reagan left office than when he took office, and that particularly minorities and other uh, less affluent groups, who on the average are less affluent, were all doing better at that time and had tremendous gains. So it, it really, Ronald Reagan proved that conservative ideas work. He proved it as governor, he proved it as president. And I think that's the legacy that ought to be an inspiration and an example for other political figures uh, to, to, to uh, bank on, uh, showing that it can be done. Mm -hmm. Sure, looks like you've been waiting patiently. Hi, I'm Heather Gratison, and I was, uh, at the ripe old age of 32, made chairman of the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is the agency that regulates buses, barges, trucks, and railroads. And uh, people were appalled that a 32-year-old would be appointed to do this. President Reagan believed in people. He didn't care necessarily what your credentials were, but he believed that if you, your objectives coincided with one another, he would support you. And one of the reasons that the nation thrived is the people believed in Ronald Reagan because he believed in them. And so my one fun story is after <coughs> he left the White House, and this may be in your book, he and Nancy went to their residence. And the next morning they got up and all the lights were on. They hadn't had to turn the lights off for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see why I'm not a stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is also to thank you so much for writing the book and researching it, and to you, Ed, for all you've done all over years. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this point about that you made, thank you, about him believing in the American people it cannot be underestimated, is that Reagan believed that America operated on a higher moral plane than any, any other country in history. And he approached the presidency in that fashion. And as a matter of fact, in his farewell remarks, he cited two of his, his accomplishments with the economy and the restoration of the Amer Amer American morale. He understood that a confident people build a growing economy, and a growing economy produces material not just goods and services for peacetime, but also for wartime. And that a growing economy produces the military might with which you can confront a Soviet empire and force them to the negotiating table and then force them eventually to surrender. So this, his belief in the American people cannot be underestimated. It's, I think it's a very, very important point. I think a corollary to that is uh, the way in which he treated people and set the, what you might call the friendship tone in Washington, D.C. Uh, because he, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, I talked with a, a congressman, a friend of mine, a Democrat congressman, and he said, uh, this was just a week ago or so, we were got to be talking about Ronald Reagan. He said, you know, uh, it was a funny thing. I came in, I was elected the same year as Ronald Reagan, and he said, within two months of my being there, I was a Democrat. <laughs> But I was invited to the White House because the president wanted to see me and talk with me and get acquainted. And there were so many, he had that sense of friendship that they were all together for the American people. And uh, he never thought of his opponents as enemies, but as, uh, or in any negative way, but as people <laughs> that need to be educated. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so that was a very important part. And that's why I think we, uh, uh, Newt can, re can remember, but I think that was during the era of the 80s, there was a much more friendly attitude and a much more friendly climate in Washington, D.C., uh, not the least of which was the fact that we, there were so many Democrats that were at social events along with Republicans at the White House with, with Ronald Reagan as their host. Um, just so there's another point. I see a number of hands. I'm going to try to get to as many as possible. I think you're, you're next, sir. But this term Reagan Democrats, we haven't had a Republican who's had that name, who's held the White House yet. Bush <laughs> Democrats, Reagan Democrats, that was a real group of people who never changed their party, but in a bipartisan way elected a president. Um, and yeah. um, if you want to speak to 
um, the bipartisanship that of the Reagan period, of, of what actually got done during those years? Well, as near as I can figure, the term Reagan Democrat was coined by Peter Goldman, who was a reporter for uh, Newsweek in 1980. That was the first time the term appeared in print. Reagan Democrat was in 1980. And, of course, Ed was there, Ed was on the plane, and Ed knew. You know, it's interesting, is is that Ronald Reagan was campaigning in New York City one week before the 1980 election. Now, you know, what Republican would be doing that today? But he also went into the barrios in, in, in East Los Angeles. He went into the inner cities of Chicago. He went to the Bronx in 1980. He campaigned in a lot of places where the Karl Roves of the world would say, it's a waste of your time, don't go there. Reagan didn't believe it was a waste of his time. Uh, and as, partially as a result is, is that was the emergence of the, uh, of the Reagan Democrat, uh, which, was, which, was, which were, you know, the, the, the scions of, of the snooty Republican machine didn't want these Eastern Europeans, uh, you know, who, who had funny last names and drank cheap beer and ate kielbasa, you know, traipsing around their country clubs and their private homes. So they became Democrats, you know, and they became Democrats in the, in the reliable and got work in Cleveland and Cortland and other places like that. But by the 1960s, the Democratic Party is starting to veer off in a different direction, you know, ap appealing to the, to, to the academy and, and to, you know, Newt was there, Newt remembers, is that is th they're starting to c cut loose from their traditional base. And Reagan de and the Democrats, these blue collar, culturally conservative Democrats, Catholic, pro-life, anti-communist, who were Democrats because the Democratic Party wanted them originally and the Republican Party didn't, are cut loose. And so Reagan makes an open appeal to them. And he talks to them in a way that John Ken no president since John Kennedy talked to them, about, talked to them about patriotism, about the future, about their children. And he talks, and I'm convinced he got this from his father, he had a, a, what I would call a parish perspective. His father was Catholic. His mother obviously was Protestant, disciples of Christ. He went to church with her. But he still got from his father a parish perspective because he didn't use the Protestant I, me, and my. He used the Catholic we, us, and ours. And I think that Reagan spoke to voters in a way that no Republican had before. Uh, and that's really was the creation of, of the Reagan Democrat because he talked to them unlike other Republicans. Yeah, I remember being with him in, in 1980 in New York, and this was in the Bronx, you're right, and he didn't have some hall or some fancy place. He was literally had a rally uh, and st standing on a flatbed truck as a stage. He talked to people who just filled the streets all around there. They blocked off some of the streets, and that was a rally that yeah. he had. And those were the people like you're talking about that came out to see him. They just wanted to see him and hear from him in person. And he had that uh, magnetic ability to, uh, to make things simple so that people could understand what he was saying and why it was important to them. And it was that quality that created what you call the Reagan Democrats. Mm -hmm. You've been waiting patiently, sir. Okay. Hi, I'm Gil Robinson. Um, and it's interesting, Craig, that you mentioned about religion, because my question is about Reagan and, and religion, and I don't want to, <coughs> uh, I don't want to mention my book on your show, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm all for Ed, more Reagan scholarship. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed wrote, Ed wrote the forward, but in the book, which was really, uh, there are 81 stories by uh, his appointees, and what really struck me and surprised me, there were several of them, not more than half a dozen, maybe more, that mentioned Reagan and religion sure. in, a, in a different way. And one of them particularly <coughs> where he was brought in early in the campaigning uh, to uh, a church and the, and the uh, person who was the, the leader of his campaign said, well, I got you the best church in this whole big city and it, it rever reverberates around the country. Reagan stopped him and said, <coughs> I'm sorry, he said, I consider myself very religious, but I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, and I will not do it, and I will not campaign in churches. And there were several stories like that. Now, what I want to ask you, did you come across any of that over Ed? I have never asked you about this, Ed. Well, uh, part of, uh, I said earlier, we had to fight back, you know, against disinformation about Ronald Reagan. 
uh, is that we spent you know several hours a day just fighting back. One of them came from uh, in my personal experience was Rick Perlstein. I went to a luncheon uh, a couple years ago where they were rolling out the uh, paperback copy of his Goldwater book, and he somebody asked him what his new book was going to be. And he said his new book was going to be about how Reagan brought the religious right into American <laughs> politics. And I was there with, um, with um, um, Bob, Bob um, Congressman from Pennsylvania. Bob Walker, Bob Walker sorry, is my <laughs> senior moment. Uh, is I was there with Bob Walker, and we kind of put our heads together, and then we said, no, that's not true. Jimmy Carter brought the religious right into American politics in 76. Reagan didn't. And we went on a chapter and verse about how Reagan, or the Carter campaign from the pulpit, and he, Reagan, and he ran as a born again. And the night of the, of the election eve in 1976, he hosts a national telethon. Jimmy Carter does. It's hosted by Reverend Pat Robertson. It was Jimmy Carter who brought the religious right into American politics. So uh, Reagan talked about God, but in a very, very subtle and humble sort of way. He ended the 1980 nomination as you remember in Detroit, and he, and he says, you know, uh, he says, I'm a little afraid to suggest what I'm about to suggest. I'm more afraid not to. Can we begin our crusade, join together in a moment of silent prayer? Uh, there was that. And then one week before the election, he did an election eve address, and he used a very interesting phrase. He, he, and he talked about, about the United States being a God-inspired country. And he used the phrase, he says, he, he says, man with God. He doesn't say man and God. He says man with God, which I always found fascinating because as far as I could tell, it, it, maybe I'm wrong, but I think his two favorite philosophers were Thomas Paine and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, how can that be? Because here's Paine, the very flower of the Enlightenment, and Solzhenitsyn gives a speech at Harvard tear, tearing the Enlightenment apart. And I think that Reagan synthesized the two positions so that so that he could he could you know the, the, the I think he, he got to a point where he believed that if if God was at the center of the universe then man was there with him because God wanted man to be at the center of the universe and therefore it wasn't inconsistent to say man with God because what man God was in every man and therefore and God wanted man to be at the center of the universe and therefore so it's God with man not God and man I, I just I just as far as I could tell is that his two favorite philosophers and it, they, it's interesting that that you that they don't agree on much and yet he's able to synthesize the two well Ronald Reagan was very religious but as you pointed out he, he had said many times he did not want anyone to feel that he was using his religion for political purposes and that was but at the same time uh, he his religion was so much a part of him uh, Paul Kengor who uh, has is one of the uh, along with my two colleagues here uh, one of the great biographers of Ronald Reagan wrote a book entitled God and Ronald Reagan and in that book he had done a lot of research on Ronald Reagan's speeches and he says in the book that as a result of that research Ronald Reagan used analogies to the Bible more than any other president, in, and all of them put together, uh, and that was just a regular part. And he he knew the Bible forwards and backwards, and so as he talked, he could work. He worked in references without saying that they were references, but he worked that into his speeches just because they, to him, they were good examples of what he was talking about. And so that was really the way in which uh, he was uh, a what you might say a, a hidden evangelist in a sense. Uh, by putting those kinds of ideas out as a part of his speeches. Um, there are a number of questions. I'm going to get to a group over here, but I'd like to, for a moment, um, um, turn to Speaker Gingrich um, because I know that Reagan influenced you. I just seeing that picture of you with the Reagans um, um, early in your your career really stands out to me, and I know it's um, that those were important years for you. Is there something you'd like to um, to say to our group this evening? <clears throat> well, thank you. First of all, it's just great to be here with you two and, and with Kyron. Um, actually, my, my favorite picture with uh, the president is at our home, and it's a, a very blown up picture from the White House photographer. And we're on one of the rare occasions I was in Air Force One, because remember, I was a very junior member back in that period, so I didn't exactly go hanging out all the time. But um, we're both in shirt sleeves, and we're both laughing. And uh, Reagan had this, as Ed well knows, Reagan had this talent uh, 
of gathering up stories and gathering up jokes. And he would come back, and the, the handful of times I flew in Air Force One with Reagan, he would always come back and say, I tried to get the pilot to go over the Capitol so we could bomb it. <laughs> <coughs> and they wouldn't do it. And I, would and I would always stand there and think, I'm your ally. <laughs> I'm on the plane because I'm with you. Know. But, but again, it, every president I've ever known has uh, had that secret desire uh, to do that. And then, and then Reagan collected, uh, as, as you know, anti-Soviet jokes. And, and he would invariably tell two or three anti-Soviet jokes. And it took me a while to realize that, that like Lincoln and to a lesser extent FDR, this was a great device to be very human, to fill up the time, and then to leave. So whatever you had come on the plane to talk to him about, by the time you thought you were about to talk to him, he went up front. Because, but, you, but you now had you know, 10 or 15 minutes of hearing interesting stories and chatting with each other. And so you felt like it was really cool. You know, I got a chance to talk to the president. Uh, but it, you know, it didn't, uh, it, it, you didn't necessarily get in what you wanted. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing I got from Reagan, Reagan came to Georgia, I think it was in January of 79. I was a freshman. I was the only Georgia federally elected Republican. And he gave a luncheon speech. And he had just uh, read... Uh, I, think it's, I think it was, was it Harriet Bush Wilson, I'm going to get her name wrong, but she was the head of the NAACP at the time. Margaret Bush Wilson. And he had actually picked up the concept of hope and opportunity from her. And so when he said it, I wrote it down. And later we, got a, we issued a budget in the House in my freshman term b during the presidential campaign that was a budget of hope and opportunity. And then, of course, we created the Conservative Opportunity Society. And I would say that a great deal of what Reagan gave us, and there's a terrific new biography of Kemp out that really reinforces this, Reagan had a, a visceral optimism that led him to get up, as he used to say, the story about the, the little boy uh, running around looking for the pony because the, the room was filled with uh, horse dung, and therefore the pony had to be a pony somewhere. I mean, Reagan, I think, lived that. And, and, and if, if you were with him, it was a fun, you could tell he was an FDR Democrat because it was a fundamental break with, with the dour, mean-spirited, and pessimistic republicanism, which had dominated the party at least since the 1930s. And he communicated a sense of joy, a sense of optimism, and a sense that we can, we can get this stuff done. And uh, it was remarkably effective. Oh, just one last anecdote. You may, may have been in the room. Uh, there was one point, I think it was in 83, where a bunch of, the, of us younger guys went down because we were going to talk to the president seriously because he was getting soft. And we just pounded on him. I mean, it, it was like 40 minutes of Reagan sitting in the cabinet room tolerating uh, all of these young guys beating him up. And, and when he finally got done listening to us, he turned and said, well, maybe I need to get shot again. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, at that point, all of us are backpedaling like crazy. <laughs> saying, no, no, no. We're with you. We're with you. Forget everything we just said. But it was that kind of ability to, to yeah. intuit the moment and exploit it. You know, what you mentioned about Air Force One, Ronald Reagan really liked to relax on Air Force One and, as you say, uh, have talk and tell jokes and that sort of thing. And, and he had a tremendous sense of humor, and it was a spontaneous sense of humor. Whatever was happening, he had either a joke or a story that somehow was very relevant to what was going on. But he had this sense of humor. And uh, my favorite uh, Air Force One story was when I had just been appointed Attorney General and Bill Smith, my predecessor, we both happened to be on the Air Force One. The President was flying to California and Bill was going home and I was out there for some mission with the President. And so there's a place on Air Force One which is a small compartment uh, which is just reserved for the cabinet. And there's a couch on one side and two armchairs uh, right on, uh, on the other side. And it just happened that Bill and I were both in those chairs sound asleep on the way out there. Ronald Reagan came by and he saw us sound asleep, so he got the White House photographer to take a picture of the two of us. <laughs> and about a week later, I get this framed picture and it said, Dear Ed, see, I told everyone you could do Bill's job and here's the proof. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my prized possessions from the, the days. <laughs>
yes, I think there are a number of people. You've been, yes, um, um, been waiting patiently. Uh, thanks again for the articles and the, all you, the stories you told. I think one of the things that came out was how much we all owe Mrs. Reagan. And I don't know if anybody's doing a book on her or that, but there's certainly not enough being done for her in, in her uh, time since. Everybody should send her a Christmas card. But, um, Craig, when you were talking about the minorities in the book, you talked about on the way home uh, back to the, air to the airport how all the people in the southeast came out totally spontaneously. And I think that spoke volumes that people just would not believe that that happened. I don't, I don't know if you can expand on that. But. Well, it, it, the, the, Ed and I were talking earlier today, and it suddenly dawned on me. You know, uh, there was, we've had presidential death before, obviously, in the history of the republic. The, the, the greatest outpouring was probably for Abraham Lincoln, for Franklin Roosevelt, and for John Kennedy, and for Ronald Reagan. But what's interesting is, is that they all died in office. Reagan died 16 years after leaving office, and yet the outpouring from the American people rivaled that of his predecessors. The, the, the week of the Reagan funeral, it's broadcast almost nonstop on cable and network, and the ratings are off the chart. But what's interesting is, is that the ratings were higher with young people, with, voters, with people, Americans under 30, than they were with people over 30. Reagan had a uh, near mystical hold on the imagination. Of course, it's because he talked about the future uh, and uh, because he gave some of his most important policy speeches on American college campuses. Um, is, but, but nobody had expected the pouring on the 101 mm -hmm. going up there, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Nobody had expected the outpouring at the U.S. Capitol. On, and I remember standing in line there and, and it was 95 degrees and 95 percent of humidity and there wasn't a breath of air and the, a long line, you know, miles long, snaking back to the, to the Air and Space Museum and beyond that, people just waiting quietly just to go in and pay their final respects to, uh, to Ronald Reagan. I don't think the elites ever understood the, the relationship and the bond Reagan had forged with the American people. They, and, and, is, and, I di and I did dwell a lot on that in the book because I wanted people to understand that the, there was a great disconnect in, the, in, that, in America that week between the American people and the American elites. The American people saw one thing about Ronald Reagan. The American elites saw something quite, uh, something quite different. And so I, I went into that on purpose so that people uh, uh, understood, you know, is that for, for FDR and for, for John Kennedy, everybody, everybody's pretty much simpatico, but even the week of the Reagan funeral, <laughs> liberal academics, liberal columnists, uh, the style section of the Washington Post, uh, is, they, they did some really nasty, uh, dirty things to Reagan uh, and his memory and some specific columnists and things like that. So, um, but, I you know, in the end is, is that uh, his legacy has been decided by the American people and not by the American elites. And I think that that's, that's you know, frankly a good thing. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I can take one more question um, in, in the back. And I think um, we are going to stay around so that you'll be able to um, mingle with the um, with our, our panelists. We have amazing food, and 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 for those of you who are old enough to drink, um, we have <laughs> as well. Um, yes. So President Reagan died, <coughs> passed away my senior year of high school, and uh, I was interested in public service. So I instead of going to Cancun, uh, I went to Washington D.C. with my dad, and I'm going to loop in the speaker, and what uh, Mr. Attorney General said a minute ago about. Uh, his optimism and a strong economy. Uh, we now have a thousand fewer Democrats in America. In 1994, we had the contract with America that inspired many people who never would have taken a risk to run for office. And now we have 70% of governors, 70%, I'm oh, sorry, over majority of governors, majority of legislatures. What do you feel like the lasting impact of his legacy will be for the people who were inspired to run by him? Well, I think, I think, I think and, and Newt probably could address this better than I could, but I think it's the reintellectualization of American politics, is that from the time in the New Deal uh, 
up until 1980 is, is that everybody agreed government was good for you and therefore more government was even better for you. The debate was over. Richard Nixon was probably the most liberal president since Franklin Roosevelt that we've had. And every, didn't matter whether it was a Republican president or a Democrat president, they all grew government because they all believed in government. And in a way, we reverted back to that. You know, George Bush ran for president in 2000, never once called for the, spend, for the elimination of one program, never called for uh, spending cuts of anything. And the phrase, big government Republican, came into vogue during his presidency. And as a result is, of his father and of him is, is that now you have a schism inside the Republican Party where we once had unity after Reagan left office. But I think the greatest domestic, or at least the greatest contribution in terms of the Republican Party, or one of the greatest, is there's a lot, there's a lot. You know, the defeat of Soviet communism is, stands as, uh, as, a, as a monument for all time, for, for a thousand years. I mean, this was, a, this was an evil empire. This was an empire that invaded and robbed and stole and killed and murdered and, uh, and built walls and did all. So the defeat of Soviet communism has to stand as one of the you know, certainly with, with the defeat of the Nazi, uh, the, the Nazi uh, Germany and with the Empire of Japan as one of the greatest victories in the history of the United States presidency, the restoration of American morale, the restoration of American belief in itself, but also, as I said before, the reintellectualization of, of, uh, 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 of American politics. And let me just say is, is that um, is, is we've gone, I think, in such a, you know, we're pushing back now against Reagan disinformation, but it's all intellectual is, is that is that we've done such a good job is that we forget you know like George Schultz you know used to say is that this was a fun guy <laughs> this was a guy who had a wonderful sense of humor I, and so I so I, is that uh, I, I would like to just leave you with with one joke that I remember that I thought particularly funny about him was that he was governor of California uh, it was 1967 it was the height of the uh, Vietnam War and uh, he's confronted, he's there in California, he's confronted by a very smelly, disheveled, dirty hippie. Uh, maybe it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> but the dirty, smelly, disheveled, dirty hippie is carrying a sign, and the sign says, make love, not war. Reagan looks at the sign, he looks at the hippie, he turns to the aide, and he says, you know, from the looks of him, I don't think he'd do either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I, I think uh, what, what you had to say uh, is correct, and uh, what uh, Craig said about Ronald Reagan, both his optimism and his, and his sense of humor, which was infectious. But uh, what he did, I mentioned earlier, that he said, uh, he proved that conservative ideas make sense. But he also proved in doing that, that conservative ideas not only make sense, but that also is good politics. And that's why he was able to be so successful in 1984. But beyond that, to show that it's good politics, he really provided the intellectual and philosophical foundation that Newt built on in 1994. Mm -hmm. Here you had had, in 1992, the other opposite party had won the election. And yet, two, two years later, taking Ronald Reagan's politics, Con Ronald Reagan's uh, philosophy, and Ronald Reagan's accomplishments and building on that, as Newt did with the contract for America, proved once again that even in what had just been a Democrat victory, that using Ronald Reagan's principles could be a massive Republican victory and bring the Republicans into office and leadership in the House of Representatives for the first time, I believe, in 40 years. So, uh, so that's, that's, it seems to me that, that what he showed, and that's a lesson Going back to what people had asked earlier uh, about how this all applies today, I think those are the lessons that if they were followed today, and, and if people who are uh, uh, expounding those lessons and promulgating those lessons of Ronald Reagan would take the time he did to say to people what it meant to them, that we would have the kind of victories that we would all enjoy and the country would be better off for it. I think we could go on. We have a number of questions for you. What's important about this book, I think, is that it will generate a conversation again about Reagan's legacy. Um, and it's not about a particular earlier period, but the period after the presidency that helps us begin to reflect. And I think you've done the most comprehensive work on that week of national mourning about Reagan. Um, and I really thank you for the work that you've done.
Um, we're going to now have a little fellowship with you. We thank Mike Frank and the, the Hoover team for all the work they've done um, and the crew um, for making this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you.